in 2021 in Presque Hill County, Sheboygan County, any surrounding county, wherever you work, wherever you go, what we need is conviction in your message. And Jesus still saves in 2021. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, we'll read two verses. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. In the last 50 years, man has made some incredible advancements in travel. I, uh, I was looking at it this, this uh, week. The Thrust SSC is a car that... Um, was made to break the sound barrier. We all know about the jets that can break the sound barrier. They can travel faster than the speed of sound. Well, a car, uh, the Thrust SSC, traveled at 763 miles an hour. If you look it up, you look at a picture of it, it literally almost looks like a jet with wheels that's propelled by rocket fuel and all this. But it was driven on the ground and it broke the sound barrier. Unbelievable. The Lockhead SR-71 Blackbird is a jet that holds the world record for the fastest uh, flight for uh, aircraft at over 2,100 miles per hour. Insane. Recently, NASA sent up a space probe to go to the sun, of all places, and it traveled at over 150,000 miles per hour. To put that in perspective, the space probe would be able to circle the world six times in an hour or circle the globe in less than four hours. Insane amount of speed, insane amount of travel. And man is just seems to be obsessed with being able to, to travel fast. And I don't know if any of us have ever traveled at those kinds of speeds, but being able to get into a vehicle and, and really be able to get to 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 miles an hour very quickly. And man has invented numerous ways to travel quickly, yet most men have no idea where they're going. And the faster we're able to travel and the, and the more advancements that we make, it seems that man really is getting nowhere faster. In the time that these advancements have been made, really from like the 1970s forward, once we got to the moon and, and uh, travel and, and science has really taken a leap forward, in that same amount of time, um, divorce rates have grown from 1 in 20 in 1970 to well over 1 in 2. Crime continues to rise. And what was once against the law is now not only widely accepted, but now becoming legalized. At the end of World War II, General Douglas MacArthur made a statement, and he predicted, he said, we have had our last chance. If we don't now devise some greater and more equitable system, Armageddon will be at our door. The problem basically is theological and involves spiritual and human character. It must be of the spirit if we are to save the flesh. Now, in the midst of the mayhem and, and the bleak times that it seems that we live, God has a promise that shines for each and every one of us. Psalms 32 verse 8 says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. This morning we're going to look at finding God's will. Finding God's will. We may say, how, how do we do that? How do I find it? What is God's will? We're going to try to look at some basic principles that will help us find God's will. In the day when people are flying all over the place, in the day when, when uh, technology is just advancing at an unbelievable rate, where sin and, and character and, and personal character is plummeting at an increasing rate, we can find God's will for our family and for us. Before the world began, God had a master plan for your life. God had a master plan for your life. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 reads, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. God, before the worlds were formed, knew that everyone in this room was going to be a person one day. Before he said, let there be light. He knew that Abby and Kurt and James and Julie and we, each one of us in this room was going to be each one of us in this room. Isn't that unbelievable? If you're a Christian this morning, God not only has a, a, a plan for your life, he not only says, well, I want Abby to be a mom or I want Curtis to be an electrician. I want James to be a defense attorney. But he also has the steps within that directed. He just doesn't say, well, Jamie, I want you to go and, be, and, and work and provide for your family. He actually guides our individual steps. Psalms 37 verse 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord 
and he, God, delighteth in his way. So God not only just gives us a general, this is what I want you to do, now figure it out. God will give us even more instructions inside of that and guide our every step. God has a plan for the plumber as well as for the preacher. God has a plan for the electrician as well as the evangelist, and he has a plan for the mechanic as well as the missionary. If God calls you to be a preacher and you become an entrepreneur, then you are accepting second best for your life. But on the flip side, if God calls you to be an entrepreneur and you become a preacher, you also are accepting second best for your life. I want us all to understand this morning before we get into how we find God's will and, and how he reveals it to us, that the highest achievement that any one of us could achieve in this room this, this morning and at the end of our life, look back and say, what was, the, what was the one thing that you would hang your hat on and say, I can't believe that I was able to do this. The highest achievement that any of us could achieve in our life is to do exactly what God wills for you to do. Whatever that is, whether it's to be a preacher, whether it's to be a scientist that cures cancer, whether it be a sanitary engineer, it doesn't matter. Whatever, if that's what God wants you to do, and you do it, that's the most unbelievable thing that you could ever do in your life. Success is not spelled M-O-N-E-Y. It's not spelled F-A-M-E. It is spelled by obedience of God's plan for your life. If you, at the end, it spells fame, and it spells money. Brianne was trying to figure out what that was. M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S, no. <laughs> obedience of God's will and God's plan for our life is the highest achievement. I want us to understand that first and foremost. So first of all, how do we find God's will? How do we figure out, okay, this is what God wants me to do? Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So how do we find that perfect will of God? Number one, we have to listen for God. We have to listen for God. We all know the story, and we won't read it for sake of time this morning, but Samuel, when he was the little boy working in the uh, temple, and Eli uh, was the man of God, and he was telling him, what he was to do, Samuel was laying in his bed and he heard God call, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up and he ran to Eli. We know the story and he said, you called me? And Samuel said, I didn't call you, go lay back down. And eventually Samuel, the, Eli realizes, oh, this is the Lord speaking to young Samuel. And he says, when he calls this time, say, Lord, um, thy servant heareth. And we learn a couple of things from this, at least I do. First of all, if Samuel, as a young boy, was laying in there with earbuds in, or he had the TV going, or he you know, was on his phone, would he have heard God's voice saying, Samuel, Samuel? It didn't say it was a booming voice, and thunder and lightning, and it was just extremely obvious that it was God talking to him. Would he have heard it? And maybe this morning we don't hear God's leading, and we don't hear God talking to us because we have too many distractions. Another thing I take away from that is that God sounded to Samuel exactly like the preacher. Samuel heard God's audible voice, and who did he think it was? Eli. He thought it was a preacher man. And oftentimes, God not only will speak to us throughout the week, but he very often will speak to us through the preaching and through the teaching. And I think that if we tune that off, if we say, well, it's just Brother Drew up there teaching, or it's just pastor, or it's just whoever is speaking, then we're going to miss a lot of the guidance for our life because when Samuel heard God speak audibly, it sounded just like the preacher. And I think that we need to listen to God if we want to find his will. Number two, we need to trust him. Uh, we need to trust him. Kurt Goldsborough tells a story when he was younger. He, of course, he had two older brothers, Jay and Jeremy, and they were at a park or somewhere, and they said uh, this phrase often. He said, open your mouth and close your eyes and you will get a big surprise. So they said that to him. So Kurt, being the younger brother, had you know, some trust and faith in them. So he closed his eyes, he opened his mouth, and he thought he was going to get a chocolate or something because the older brothers would always you know, put something good in his mouth if he had the opportunity. They put dog poop in his mouth. And uh, he just relayed the story how he had that trust and then he didn't trust them. Again, he never closed his mouth and opened, or no, closed his eyes and opened his mouth because he did get a big surprise, but it wasn't the one I don't think that he was looking for. We trust implicitly with our lives many things throughout a day, throughout a week. When we get into the, a car and we drive, 
50, 60, if you're Katie, 70, 80 miles an hour. We trust that when we go and hit the pedal on the left, that it's going to slow the vehicle down. If those brakes just don't work, we're gonna run into somebody or something. I remember one time we were pulling into the Chinese parking lot. We were, I was in my dad's Astro van. You guys, anyone remember that green Astro van that my dad used to drive? We were pulling into Chinese in the back parking lot after church and we were, about, we were about to our parking spot. Dad stepped on the brake and it literally just nothing. And he got off of it and he, I remember he like pulled himself on the steering wheel, pushing on the brake as hard as he could and there was literally nothing. And we ran into uh, the car that was in the parking lot in front of us. We had the police come, they did a report or whatever, and then dad kind of drove the vehicle around the parking lot again. Brakes worked just fine. Just for one random reason, the brakes literally did not work. And, but we trust that when we get into a vehicle, that the brakes are gonna stop, realizing that if we can't stop, we're, we could get in, injured and die. Ladies, this morning when you plug in your curling iron or your straightener or whatever, if you had curly hair, you probably straightened it. If you had straight hair, you probably curled it. When you plugged in that, that deal, you trusted that the electrical current that was in there that has enough power to be able to cook a chicken in a pressure cooker in like a half an hour, that that wasn't going to jump across the cord and jump into your body and stop your heart. There's a lot of power in that socket. You didn't even think about it, you just boom, plugged it in. When you go to a fast food restaurant, I'm sure everybody at one point ate at a fast food restaurant uh, this week at some point, you went to McDonald's or something. The trust that you have in that establishment, just not for you to die, from the way that they treat the food in the back. I mean, the condiments at McDonald's get put on with like a cock gun. You ever see them? They're like, they have tubes of mayonnaise and stuff. And whenever they do, uh, right, am I right? Yeah, and, it, and they just like give you a little squirt of whatever, mayonnaise or ketchup and whatnot. You have a lot of trust in that place. You trust the pharmacy if, you, if they write you a prescription, you get the same orange little container, right? I mean, you could be getting like just a little bit of Advil for something, or you could be getting like a really like powerful drug that if it was given to the wrong person and they got mixed up, oh, this orange bottle and that orange bottle and that orange bottle, and you grab the wrong orange bottle and you take the wrong pill, you could die. But we just don't even think about it. We open up the little bag, pop in the pills, because we trust. We trust the doctor to give the right diagnosis. I mean, if the doctor says, hey, you need to do this, we, we sign our life away to do it. We trust in all those things, yet we won't trust the creator of the universe with our life. The life that he gave us. And the life that he can see from beginning to end, and that he could see before he created the world that we live in. You see how foolish it is that we would trust a vehicle more than we would trust God with our life? Or we trust a pharmacist or a doctor? It just doesn't make any sense. If a stranger walked up to me this morning, if I was walking around and a stranger said, hey, would you do something for me? I probably would say something like, sure. You know, what is it? What do you need? And if they said, oh, I can't tell you, just, you know, get in the car, just trust me. I probably would say something like, well, you know, what is it? You know, or I need to know you a little bit better. Just kind of let me know I'm willing to help you, but I kind of need some more information. If it's just a stranger, you're not just going to implicitly trust them and get in a vehicle or hold something for them. You're going to kind of need to know a little bit. It reminds me of when my, I made my first flight by myself. I was going down to Josh Winstead's funeral. Funeral. His wedding. Same thing. When I'm going down to his wedding. And uh, I was flying to uh, New Mexico. And my dad said, now, if you, dad's a little over careful sometimes on some things. He says, if somebody comes up to you and they, and they ask you to hold their suitcase and then they leave, don't hold it. I'm like, well, that's good advice in an airport. So, you know. Anyways. <laughs> But if my wife said, hey, babe, can you do something for me? And I said, sure, what do you need? And she said, uh, just trust me. I would be a much more willing to do whatever she asked and just trust her because I, know, because I know her and I love her, I would know that she wouldn't put me in any situation that would put me in harm or embarrass me or, or whatever. Maybe the reason that we're not willing to do everything that the Lord asked for us is because we don't know him enough and therefore we don't trust him enough. To know God is to love him to love God is to trust Him. To trust God is to obey Him. And to obey Him is to be blessed. I'll read that again. To know God is to love Him. To love God is to trust Him. 
To trust God is to obey him, and to obey him is to be blessed. So how do we find God's will? Number one, we've got to listen. Number two, we have to trust. Number three, we have to commit to him. Proverbs 3, 6 is, we already read it in our text one time, and often we will read quickly over the first part, and then we'll read it like this. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That's the fun, fuzzy part. But it reads, in all thy ways acknowledge him. That means in every aspect of life, in every whatever it is that we acknowledge, we bring him into it. Athletes often will commit to a college. And we'll see, you know, on these higher profile athletes where they know like this guy is going to be an exceptional athlete. He's going to do very well wherever he goes to college. He's going to be, you know, a first round draft pick, whether it be NBA or or uh, NFL or whatever it is, they'll often have like a, a conference when, they're, when they've when narrowed it down between a couple schools and they'll have a, a table set up and they'll have like their mom and dad there and then they'll have all the reporters and they'll have a couple of hats of all the different you know schools that they're considering, you know, like USC and Alabama and all that. And then they'll answer a few questions and then when the time comes, they'll reach over and they'll grab the hat of the school that they're going to go to and they put it on and by doing that they're committing to that college and then at that point they're all in they're going to eat sleep and drink whatever that is you know roll tide or or michigan or really no one goes to michigan state anymore but wherever it is they're they're committed that's it and god i feel like is sometimes sitting in the reporting stands and he's watching you and you have all the hats in front of you and you know, you're waffling over which, which one you're gonna do, and God's thinking, dude, take my hat. I have the best option for you. I have the best plan. Just, if you commit to me, it, it's gonna be the best situation for you. And when we commit to God, it means that we commit in all areas. It doesn't mean that we have, oh, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll commit to you in, in these areas, but then if, if I have any you know, Friday games, I'm gonna play for this school. You know, Whenever an athlete commits, they play all of their games for that team. And when you commit to God, you have to play all your games for God's team. That means in your business or your work that you commit to God. That means in your recreation. This is just a side note, and I don't know what any of you do on vacation because I don't go on vacation with you, so I can say this with, you know, without any... Um, knowing what you do, but it, it just makes me scratch my head. When someone goes on a vacation, if, why wouldn't they go to church? It's like if you go to church on a regular week, a regular day, do you just take a vacation from being a Christian too? Like it, it just, it makes me wonder. It just, you know, you commit to God in your relationships, in the people that you build relationships with, the people that you hang out with, uh, your home and your family, that you commit that to God, that you commit your worship to God. Every aspect, we commit it to God because God can't direct us in the way that we need to go if we're only half in, half out. John 4, 34 says, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus had a unique perspective and he came to earth and he did God's will. And the, Satan tempted him. He had, Jesus had the option in front of him to not do God's will, to stray from God's will. But Jesus said, the whole reason I'm here, the whole deal that my whole life is just doing whatever God's will is. Jesus understood that his purpose on earth was to do his Father's will, and we will only, not only do we need to do God's will, but we're only going to experience that satisfaction and the joy and the happiness and the fulfillment when we do what God has for us. Pastor says often that every man has a God-sized hole in his life, and often these people who are looking for, you know, they're looking for something. They're trying to find themselves. They're looking for God. Because without God, without doing what he wants us to do, your life is empty. It doesn't have purpose because you're not doing God's will. There's nothing, I tried to sum this all up in my own words and, and uh, make a, uh, an original statement, if you will. There's nothing that we give up to do God's will, but we do give up everything when we choose not to do his will. There's nothing that we give up when we do God's will, but we give up everything when we refuse it. So that's how we find it. But how will God direct? How will God direct us? How will he practically show us what it is that he wants us to do? Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all thy ways acknowledge him. We talked about that. And he shall direct 
thy paths. Isaiah 30 verse 21 says, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. Isaiah is saying, Jesus is going to be behind you. And uh, you ever see like that deal where people put their hands behind their back and then someone stands behind them and puts their arm through it and it, and it makes it look like their arms or your arms? Um, Jesus will do that and he'll say, hey, you should go over here. Hey, you should go over there. Hey, you should go over here. How cool would it be to have Jesus behind you directing you in every decision that you make in a day? You feel pretty confident that whatever decision you make that it would be the right one. You say, uh... Wow, we're getting really off track now. He's like Ratatouille, the little, the little mouse in the chef's hat, and he's controlling him, and he, te he teaches him how to cook. Jesus is doing that for us. He's saying, hey, do this. Hey, go there. This is the right decision. So how will God direct us? Number one, through his word. Psalms 119.05 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word makes life so simple. How is that? How does God's word make my life simple? Simple because it makes, God's word makes a lot of his, our decisions for us. There's so many principles and so many, what we would say, oh, I don't know, this is a gray area. A lot of the gray areas have made, been made gray by, by man, but really they're pretty clear cut in the Bible. Maybe we say, oh, pastor, would you pray for me about playing the lotto? I'm thinking about getting these tickets, you know, because it's October, it's missions month, and I want to see if I can hit it big so I can give this money to missions. Well, God already made that decision for us to not play the lottery, and we won't get into why it's not biblical. There's, there's not an 11th commandment that says thou shalt not scratch off. Okay, but there is a principles in the Bible that talk about how ill-gotten gain, it talks about the lottery, somebody has to lose in order for someone else to win, right? Not stealing. The Bible says thou shalt not steal. Okay, there's principles. But maybe Paul Pastor pray with me about... Um, going to this party and drinking so I fit in with my buddies at work so I can be a testimony to them. Well, the Bible is super clear about that. The Bible says that wine's a mocker, strong drink's raging, whoever's deceived thereby isn't wise. Pray with me about uh, doing these drugs to ease the pain of my loss. Pray with me about, you know, I'm thinking about going to Med's Cafe and getting some stuff because I just can't handle what I'm going through. The Bible is very uh, straightforward about that. Pray with me about uh, aborting my baby. I don't know if, if you know, I'm in a position where I can get care of it. Would you see if it's the Lord's will? The Bible says in one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. And what always makes me scratch my head is um, the people who argue that a baby isn't a baby in the womb. If life hasn't started, then why do you have to end it? Right? If it hasn't begun, then why do you have to end it? Pray with, that, that's not even biblical, that's just common sense. They don't even use common sense. Pray with me about not going to church anymore, Pastor. I just don't know if, you know, if that would be God's will for me. Pretty clear in the Bible, God says, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Pray with me about not tithing so that I can make my bills. I could really use that extra 10%. The Bible makes it super clear about that. And, and we could go on and on and on. The Bible makes a lot of our decisions for us. And we really are left with not many decisions to be made because God has made a lot of those hard decisions for us. All we have to do is just commit to his word and then his word is going to guide us through a lot of the situation. Now, a lot of times these people that you work with secularly, they always have the hard luck story. It was always a terrible weekend. They always had this emergency and that emergency and you scratch your head and you say, am I just that lucky? No, you're not. You're just living life the way that God intended it and God did not intend life to be that difficult. Through revelation in our hearts, God will speak to us as well. But number one, through his word, God will also guide us through revelation in our hearts. Acts 1.24 says, And then he, they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. With the apostles, they were looking for some direction and who to send where. God speaks to hearts and give direction when we pray. Acts 8.29 says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. This is a, the story where Philip was running alongside the chariot. And uh, that's pretty cool. That guy must have been fast to run like a horse. Uh, I would not have kept up. That man would have been lost if I was the preacher because I wouldn't have been able to keep up with the horse. Uh, that's a cool story. But the Holy Spirit said, Hey, go do this. And he just, boom, did it. God spoke to him. Nehemiah 7.5 said, And my God put in my heart to gather together the nobles and rulers and the people. Nehemiah had a burden that God spoke to him. And God said, You guys need to go back and rebuild the wall. God will speak to you. 
through the revelation in your heart. When we are right with the Lord, we feel his leading. And that gives us a really big commission because when we're not right with the Lord, God will stop speaking to us. And God doesn't draw away from us. We know that whenever we feel distanced from God, God's not the one who moved, we are. And we say, God, where are you? Why did you go away from me? Well, God's saying, why did you go away from me? I didn't go anywhere, I'm still right here. The Bible says if we draw nigh to God, then he'll draw nigh to us. But when we're living right, then God can give us those pricks in our heart and tell us, hey, I want you to do this. Hey, I want you to do that. And he'll guide us through revelation in our heart. He'll guide us through wisdom. We won't spend a lot of time here because we've been laying out a foundation of wisdom. But James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and, he shall, and it shall be given him. God will give us wisdom. We know that wisdom is not just common sense, but it's uncommon sense given from God. And God will give us that discernment if we ask him. Then God also will guide us through providence. Many times, God's will can be found by the open door. You can think about times in your life where you've had kind of a decision and between maybe two or three options, and it seemed like a couple of the options just kept not working out. You know, the meeting got canceled or the house sold or whatever it is, and there was just one path or one choice that just always seemed to be not necessarily the easiest, but it just seemed like the way to go, and often that's God's will. Revelations chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 talks about an open door that only God closes and only that God opens. Kara went down to Pensacola to get her nursing program and what was it, like the top 250 would make it in? So they went into the nursing program then, you know, I'm probably telling you it wrong, but you had to have the, the highest the highest GPAs got into the nursing program first. And she had roommates who had lower GPAs who made it in, and she didn't, and she went before the board and all the stuff, tried to figure out, and they just said, you know, we can't tell you why you didn't make it, you just didn't make it. I feel like that was a door that was, God was closing for no other reason than she needed to not be there so that she could come up here so she could meet this knucklehead because I had no idea what I was doing. And it's just cool to see the, the time where I had things going on in my life that made no sense that were difficult and that, that I thought were terrible and that God was abandoning me. And Kara had the same thing, but he was really just kind of directing our paths, closing and opening doors to guide us together to meet. And I, I can say without a shadow of a doubt that Kara is the wife that I was supposed to marry because it, it happened not on my own accord. I had never met her before. Hebrews, the Hebrew word for direct in that verse, direct thy paths, is to cut a path or to clear the way. Jesus cuts our path, he clears our way, and he gives us a pretty direct path to follow. If you hit opposition at every turn and you have to force it to make it to work, it may not be God's will. In my life, every providential gift that I've had from God, everything that I can say, you know what, at the end of the day, if I had to choose the things that really matter most, it would be Kara, it would be my job here at the church, and my two children. Each of those things happened completely providentially, miraculously. The way that I met Kara, there's no way that I should have met Kara except for God's leading. I did not want to come back here and work at church. As a young person, I was like, I ain't going home. I ain't working for dad. I don't want to go back. But God worked it out to where this is where I came back. And I know this is God's will. There's no way that how we should have got Tucker. It should have taken longer and we should have ended up with a different child down the road. There is literally no way that Quinn happened, okay? But God and every single one of those things worked farther than, you know, my understanding, better than my understanding, and it was just an open door and he dropped it right in my lap, okay? Probably because he knew that I'm a knucklehead and I wouldn't have found it if I had to. He just had to put it right there. But often, we don't have to find God's will. Often, if we just keep living right, he'll just drop his will right in our lap. Luke 6.10 says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in that which is much. And he that is unjust in the least is also unjust in much. The way to find God's will for your life is to do God's will in the next 15 minutes. He that is faithful in the least. Plug yourself in. Make sure that you're doing right. Don't just live like a heathen and say, well, when my opportunity comes, if you continue to live that way, your opportunity ain't going to come. And that was one of the biggest things that the Lord had revealed to me is God's will was right now. God's will is this minute. I have to do his will right now. And it may not be super grand and glorious, 
but it's what his will is. A man confided in his friend and he said, I have been called to be a missionary. And his friend asked, knowing that this wasn't, you know, a man that was real on fire for the Lord, he said, well, what are you doing for the Lord right now? The man answered, well, not much. His friend ended the, con ended the conversation by saying, well, then don't go overseas and do it. Be willing to do God's will every day, day by day. And at the end of your life, you'll look back and you'll be able to say, I lived my life completely in God's will and do it, did exactly what God had for me to do. Lifetime of labor is still